This lecture is on fracture healing and repair. I'm Saki Brahman, one of the orthopedic surgeons at uh, Temple University Hospital, director of orthopedic trauma. And uh, these are my conflicts of interest over the last 12 months. Uh, you can certainly pause this if you like. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact me at the email below. These are elective lecture objectives. So number one, to understand basic bone anatomy and biology, to understand how bone develops and heals after fractures, to understand why some fractures do not heal, and to understand the complications and associated injuries that present with fractures. So just an overview first, we'll go through some basic definitions, basic uh, anatomy and biology, talk about fracture repair, and um, then we'll conclude this first portion of the lecture. So it's a basic definition, so hopefully this is a little bit review in the next few slides. Uh, we'll talk about long bones, we'll talk about flat bones. Some examples of long bones are shown here, the radius and ulna, the humerus, femur, tibia, metatarsals, metacarpals, and flat bones include the clavicle and ribs, and how these bones form uh, embryologically, for instance, is, and, and as we grow, um, uh, differs as we'll get to. Other basic terminology, um, you know, proximal is uh, towards the center of the body and distal is uh, further away. Uh, so in the femur, uh, the distal end of the femur is down here, the proximal end is at the hip joint. Um, you have uh, cancellous bone versus cortical bone. So cortical bone is sort of that thick bone that you have uh, mostly, uh, for instance, in the diaphysis of this femur, um, although you have a thin cortex everywhere else, and um, uh, cancellous bone is uh, predominates, for instance, in the uh, metaphysis and in the epiphysis, for instance, okay? Um, the diaphysis also has a medullary canal, okay, like bone, where you have bone marrow. Um, the metaphysis is this sort of trabecular end, this would be the metaphysis of the um, uh, the femur uh, approximately, and then this would be the distal femur here, uh, where apparently I guess there's going to be a fracture, uh, and then the epiphysis is sort of that articular end, okay? A couple words about bone structure, okay? So we talked about cortical and cancellous bone. So cortical bone is that compact bone. So for instance, in the femoral diaphysis, you know, and then you have lots of dense cortical bone. Um, it makes up about 80% of the skeleton. It has high compressive bending and rotational strength uh, and is a relatively slow turnover of bone as opposed to cancellous bone, which is more of a spongy bone. That's 20% of the skeleton. It's less dense and strong, but it has a higher turnover rate. So for instance, like a fracture would heal faster here than it would in the, in the cortical bone. A few words about uh, cellular biology. I won't get into too much detail, but a uh, few cells that you should uh, be aware of are the osteoblast. Okay, so as you can see shown here, the osteoblast uh, forming bone along this periphery. The osteocytes, which sort of maintain the bone and they reside in so-called Hauschip's lacunae, uh, and then osteoclasts, which resorb bones. So you can see some here. These are uh, multi-nucleated uh, uh, type cells, uh, sort of a macrophage type lineage, and they, they uh, secrete like uh, a carbonic and hydrous enzyme, and uh, that uh, sort of removes bone. So you sort of have this balance between the osteoblast and osteoclasts, uh, to, for instance, remodel bone as needed. Tissue surrounding the bone include, most importantly, the periosteum. Okay, this is a connective tissue membrane that covers the bone. Uh, it's highly vascular and cellular. It contributes to increasing cortical diameter in kids. And kids have a very thick periosteum, typically. Um, it's what allows you to get, for instance, a so-called green stick fracture where you break on only one end and the other end, the periosteum is so thick and the bone is sort of uh, a little bit less brittle and uh, bends very easily uh, that you don't really see in adults. Um, it develops uh, callus during fracture healing. So this is that, again, it's highly vascular, cellular. It's a good source for the fracture to heal. 
Um, other tissues include bone marrow, so you have red marrow uh, versus yellow marrow. So red marrow has more hematopoietic cells as opposed to yellow, the yellow marrow, which is mostly fatty. Okay, two types of bone formation that you need to know about, especially the first one here, endochondral ossification. All right? This is where bone formation replaces a cartilage model, meaning you form cartilage and then it calcifies to form bone. Um, osteoprogenitor cells arrive via vascular buds and uh, a long bone, for instance, the femur would grow this way. And importantly, this is also the mechanism by which fracture repair takes place. So fracture repair sort of mimics this uh, endochondral ossification model. Um, intramembranous ossification, on the other hand, in bone formation is in the flat bones. So we talked about the clavic clavicle, ribs, pelvis. Um, so here you actually get bone formation without a cartilage model and the bone cells kind of go right into osteoblasts. So I said we were going to focus a little more on endochondral bone formation. So here's just a very quick overview of uh, how um, a long bone, for instance, like let's just say the humerus or something, would uh, form. So, um, the, and this is embryo, embryolo uh, embryological, so you can see how at six weeks you have this cartilage model, uh, then you develop some uh, vascularization, uh, you get some resorption in the, in the canal, and you start to form this uh, medullary canal. Uh, and then you get a secondary ossification center here with, um, you know, now you have uh, blood supply coming in here as well, but it's sort of separated by this growth plate. And you can see here what forms is a physis or um, the so-called growth plate. And that growth plate is where new bone forms until maturity. So here's that growth plate. So the physis is that growth plate, and uh, again, this is a cartilage model that then forms bone. Okay, so you have a, um, and this is, you know, sort of uh, going going down this way, okay, from immature uh, to mature, or I should say cartilage. So you have a resting or reserve zone where stores, cell, I'm sorry, cells store up lip, uh, lipids, glycogen, proteoglycans, then a proliferative zone. Okay, right over here where you have longitudinal growth and sort of these, this columnar stacking of chondrocytes. Then you have a hypertrophic zone over here where the chondrocytes increase in size. And then you have the zone of uh, ossification, which is over here. And then here's your, um, you know, your mature trabecular bone. Okay, so that is the growth plate or the physis. Um, so, endochondral bone formation grows in this manner, um, and this is what makes long bones grow. So, for instance, at the, here you can see here's a, here's a growth plate here, okay, I kind of obliterated it, but you can kind of see it here on the other side, okay, that sort of line that looks like maybe there's a fracture, here's another one here, these are, okay, these are growth plates, it looks like sort of this almost like a fracture uh, without all the sharp edges and that's in a child that would be the growth plate. Now the clinical correlation is um, if you have some type of abnormality at the growth plate you can't grow long bones. Alright so uh, for instance achondroplasia or somebody who's an achondroplastic dwarf um, and I think these are uh, you know, patients who have, uh, for instance, they have normal uh, sized flat bones such as um, in the skull, um, but they have very short limbs uh, and uh, they, are, uh, they have, actually there's a defect in the proliferative zone. Um, and then there's other forms of, uh, um, of a pathology here such as mucopolysaccharidosis where there's a defect in the hypertrophic zone and in rickets and osteomalacia you have a problem in the ossification zone uh, so these are all forms of uh, bone disease that can occur due to uh, abnormal bone growth so a couple of definitions about fractures uh, since we're going to be talking about fracture healing so firstly it means the same thing as broken um, sometimes you know, a lot of patients often say, well, is it broken? 
or is it fractured? I mean, for us, it means the same thing. Defined by disruption of the bone cortex, as shown here. It can occur in any type of bone, it can occur in any part of bone, and essentially results in pain, loss of related function. So you can't facilitate motion, uh, the bone can't provide structural support. I mean, this is why you have your skeleton. When it's fractured, it's no longer doing either of those. Now, these occur by you know, mechanisms such as mechanical failure of bone under stress like axial loading, okay, and that's a compressive force, um, rotation, uh, torsion, bending, missile injury, and, and we're not going to go through too much detail, but if, if you rotate with us, you may sort of see and hear some discussion about, you know, how different fracture patterns occur. So for instance, you would imagine a rotational injury can cause a spiraling fracture, um, a bending injury can cause a fracture like this where you can imagine uh, there's been some bending force applied um, and uh, you know that can cause a fracture to occur this way uh, you could have a missile injury now unfortunately at Temple Hospital we see a lot of gunshot injuries so um, to wrap up this portion of the lecture, we're going to talk about cellular and molecular uh, regulation of fracture repair. Uh, we'll go through the stages of fracture repair, uh, the concept of how skeletal repair recapitulates the skeletal development with um, uh, endochondral bone formation, and then uh, we'll talk about the components required for skeletal repair, including uh, cells, extracellular matrix, blood supply, molecules, and growth factors. And for bone repair, you really have to have uh, a host of things to take place. I mean, there are some biologic factors that can affect the success or failure of bone repair as, uh, in addition to mechanical factors. So things like advancing age, low functional capacity, poor nutrition, inadequate perfusion, poor soft tissue envelope, wound contamination, tumor infection, smoking. These things all adversely affect the success of bone healing. Mechanical factors uh, that can adversely affect bone healing would be lack of bone contact. Um, so if you just have a huge gap or you know complete lack of stability uh, could also uh, prevent a bone from healing or fracture from healing, I should say. So the stages of fracture repair, these are classic stages. Some people um, break them into four stages with uh, this being one, two, three and four, but otherwise it's the same thing. It's just whether or not this is divided up. So you have inflammation first. Uh, you get a hematoma formation, and I'll show these in the next few slides. Then you have repair, hard, uh, soft and then hard callus, and then you have a remodeling phase, which can take a long time. And, uh, and when you're younger, it can, this whole process can be much quicker when you're a three-year-old versus if you're a 70-year-old. So the inflammatory phase, you get bleeding. You essentially get a fracture hematoma. This is where you see bruising if it's a subcutaneous fracture. Uh, and literally there's a big hematoma that sits there, like blood that just fills this space. And that delivers hematic poetic cells, uh, including osteogenic cells. Um, and eventually this hematoma can organize into a so-called granulation tissue, right? So uh, in the reparative phase, you first get the soft bridging callus. And here you start to get this endochondral ossification, right? So you get a cartilage model that forms, um, the hematoma organizes, and then that eventually turns into a hard uh, so-called um, woven callus, um, and that's bone uh, forming through endochondral ossification. Initially it's unorganized, but um, uh, this will then become organized in the remodeling phase or you now have mature bone. Um, there are uh, stresses uh, that uh, will cause the bone to remodel accordingly. So where you're under more compressive stress, for instance, there's going to be more bone being formed. Um, and essentially that so-called wo woven bone is replaced with um, you know, your lamellar bone, kind of like we saw in one of those slides where I showed the, you know, the cortical bone, for instance, and um, that sort of uh, um, nice architectural structure. Um, here's some, you know, just the stages of fracture healing shown um, under uh, micrograph. So 
Uh, these are animal fractures and you can see the inflammation or inflammatory phase initially uh, where you know you have a little bit of bleeding and then you have um, the soft callus phase where you have a lot of um, uh, cartilage being formed uh, and uh, collagen type 2 and then you have a hard callus and now you're starting to see osteocalcin uh, deposition and bone formation and then the, you know the remodeling phase um, uh, shown on the bottom. So as a reminder remember there's two paths to forming bone okay intramembranous ossification which we uh, didn't really talk about because it really doesn't contribute to fracture healing and then endochondral ossification where you have you know sort of in the growing child the growth plate the physis uh, and that's very similar to how when you get a fracture you get this cartilage model followed by followed by formation of bone through the stages of fracture healing now those components again were cells from bone marrow, periosteum, other sources, extracellular matrix to provide a scaffold for cells, blood supply to supply oxygen and other systemic factors for, for cell survival, and then bone growth molecules and their receptors, things like bone morphogenetic proteins uh, and things like that to induce cells to proliferate and differentiate into cartilage and bone. So here you can see um, uh, cells can be derived from uh, uh, the soft tissues, uh, from the uh, periosteum that we talked about before, and also the endosteum. Now the extracellular matrix is, um, uh, structure is, um, I'm sorry, function is to provide structure, uh, sort of a space and a surface for adhesion of cells. Um, so it's a framework essentially and a mechanical environment for healing and it's composed of collagen fibers, non-collagenous proteins, growth factors, and minerals. Um, now, if you're trying to get a fracture to heal uh, and you have literally a large gap with no uh, extracellular matrix, sometimes you can use bone graft materials, like patient's bone trans, you know, basically uh, uh, transplanted from elsewhere in the, in the patient's, from the patient's body to an area where you have a, a need or bone from a bone bank, or a commercially available products like hydroxyapatite, calcium phosphates, calcium sulfates. The blood supply, as I mentioned, is essential for successful healing. It's a key for cells, nutrients, and growth factors. And the bone only forms where there's a blood supply. So um, if you don't have a blood supply, you're not going to form bone. Angiogenesis coordinates the conversion of cartilage to bone during endochondral ossification, and disruption leads to interruption of healing. So there's a whole host of molecules, growth factors, and their receptors. Uh, I kind of highlighted bone morphogenetic proteins here because these are actually um, commercially available products that you can use to potentially assist your fracture to heal uh, that you may hear about.